Hey everybody, I'm Pastor AJ Houseman, and welcome to 10 Foot Pole, a podcast dig deeper into aspects of the Bible that get glossed over or totally ignored in most preaching. The Bible has a lot of parts that are racy, uncomfortable, and sometimes downright horrifying. Let's talk about it. Welcome to season three, episode 30. We've come to the ep- the last episode of our third season. It's It's crazy. It's been a fun ride so far. Um, we have an amazing special guest for our final episode this season, Bishop Bill Goal of the Delaware, Maryland Synod, my bishop. Thank you so much for joining us today, Bishop Goal. Thank you for having me. This is my uh, my favorite, if not only, podcast that I listen to. <laughs> well, aw, I'll take that as we uh, um, get going here. Uh, so uh, the other thing is, like, you're you're a peak guest, right? Like, you need to be on every season because you're uh, you're a great guest. <laughs> Well, and uh, it's good to be connected to this ministry, uh, which you lead on behalf of our synod and the larger life of this church. Mm -hmm. And I am very proud of it. So today, uh, the bishop and I are going to talk about um, Ephesians 2, chapter 11 through 22, for Sunday, July 21st. Yes, that was a question because I was in the wrong tab and I was looking at something else. You're right. Mm-hmm. That's yep. what I'm mm-hmm. going to talk about. Mm-hmm. Yep, great. That's what you prepared for. Excellent. Uh, <laughs> love when we come down on the same thing. Um, so uh, we're going to dive into Ephesians. Uh, I, you know, I, I like to I like to stream away from the gospel um, some, um, partially because I feel like when we talk about things that you're maybe not going to hear about in churches on Sundays, uh, most patr- pastors do preach on the gospel. And so sometimes when you get texts like this Ephesians ones, it leaves us wondering, right? Like, I feel like there's a few more questions to be asked here about what's being said, and we just kind of read it and move on. Um, and so I'm going to read it, and I'm going to read the New Revised Standard Version today, and then um, we'll get into it. Wonderful. Remember, I, I yep. appreciate that we're doing something other than the gospel reading because um we're we're missing some real treasures and this one i don't know that i would call ephesians 2 a treasure but it's 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 pretty rich Mm -hmm. well we're gonna make it a treasure today all right here we go remember that at one time you gentiles by birth called the uncircumcision by those who are called the circumcision a physical circumcision made in the flesh by human hands remember that you were at that time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace. In his flesh, he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall that is the hostility between us. He has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace, and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death that hostility through it. So he came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off and peace to you who those were near, for through him both of us have access in one spirit to the father so then you are no longer strangers or aliens but you are citizens of the saints and also members of the household of god built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with christ himself as the cornerstone in him the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the lord in whom you also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for god the word of the lord Thanks be to God. I I really like this because I think it comes at a time, um, as we were talking before we started recording, of some great division um, that we see, I think, both in the church um, and in our world, um, and just kind of getting this big slap in the face that's like, no, no, um, th- this is what happened, right? Like, in Christ, you are not separated anymore. And I actually yeah. like this language of, like, through the cross, putting to death the hostility, it's just a powerful phrase to me. I think it is. I mean, there's a lot of life and death language here. Um, of course, what intrigued me about this text at, at its very beginning is the word remember. Mm. That's how it starts. Remember. Yeah. And whenever you have the word remember, 
Um, you can tell that Paul is sort of digging in. This is something you should know about because it's something I've already talked about before. So this, this text is a logical conclusion of what Paul has been beating the drum about before this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he talks that, you know, what this is culminating is that he's trying to really get across that salvation, that it, that it comes by grace alone, that all of us were dead as doornails in our sins and trespasses, but we've been made alive and God's grace has made something of a disparate group mm -hmm. uh, to unite us, something that's stronger, um, that's, you know, uh, you know, that makes us citizens with the saints, that makes us, you know, uh, living stones, part of a part of a, you know, a spiritual home. It's 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 not cheap. It's not inexpensive. It's 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 deadly serious. This is mm -hmm. Paul. Remember, yeah. If you're not gonna if you're not gonna remember everything else, remember this. You yeah. have all been made known, made um, made known to God. You've been made new by God's really stunning grace. Yeah, and that it's like it's distributed equally here, and I think that's the mm -hmm. language we get. Um, so oftentimes we'll see in some of the letters um, this circumcision versus uncircumcision and so mm -hmm. part of the 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 jewish faith right like that's that's a that's a thing right like a it's a bris right isn't that what that's called yes, yes. when when men are uh received into the covenant through 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 the bris um that makes that makes them authentically and more fully jewish correct and so in uh, those that were not of the Jewish tradition didn't do that, right? And so that's where they're like nailing that home was sort of like, because one of the big conversations was, well, do these people have to become Jewish first in order to be followers of Christ? Um, and, and Paul comes down a few times and be like, no, that's no, this is totally new. It's a totally new thing. Um, and people come as they are, right? And if you come from your own background, you can come from this background. Um, but in this you're all made whole by this blood of Christ. You're all brought near by this. Yeah, yeah it's, um, you know, riffing on that theme of remembering. Mm -hmm. What follows in this, in this, in this part of the passage is really remarkable. You know, um, when you, when you connect it to the Jewish covenant tradition um, and, and what Paul is saying, it, in, with our modern ears, we can we can scarcely imagine how radical Paul's words here are. Yeah, um, there was no, you know, there was no more deep a chasm for our Jewish siblings um, in life than than that which separated them spiritually from everyone else. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the 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 Hebrew scriptures remind us that. Uh, these siblings have been elected out of the nations for God's glory. The difference between them and anyone else you could name could not have been more significant. Mm -hmm. And so no no human being was ever able to bridge that divide. Um, and so when Paul does this, I mean, when Paul says, you know, that, that God and Jesus Christ is reconciling us in a way that we have um, siblinghood with our Jewish siblings, um, uh, you know, it's like it's like it's like Paul standing on the edge of the Atlantic Ocean and jumping uh, mm. to get to the other mm. side. I mean, yeah. it really it's 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 a it's 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 a jump. And and of course, this text provides sort of the running ramp that, you know, mm. the the running start to, to make the leap. And and there were things that could happen to bring an outsider in to um, the covenant with God. Um you mentioned, you know, that for men, uh, mm -hmm. a, a minor surgical procedure uh, <laughs> was required, right? Uh, a whole lot of education on a very complex set of laws was involved for everyone. Mm -hmm. And there was an expectation of hyper strict adherence to those laws. Mm -hmm. But in truth, when everyone, you know, when everything else is said and done, um, the outsider coming into the Jewish tradition was still a second class person to a degree. Uh, they could be tolerated inside of God's chosen people if they, they toe the line and and you know follow the law, ate what they were supposed to eat the way they were supposed to eat it, didn't violate the Sabbath, you know. But but um, Scott Hutzie, um, uh, who's a Pauline scholar, I think at Princeton, said that whereas 
Jews could trace their relationship back to God with a thick line drawn by a, a sharpie. Uh, these other folks had kind of a dotted line connecting mm -hmm. them to God, and so not as not as permanent and not surely as uh, as good a line mm -hmm. because they 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 came in they weren't sent forth. Mm -hmm. um, and now here's Paul saying, nope, not anymore. Everyone's lying to God is as uh, thick and rock solid and permanent as it can be. Yeah. And everyone's line is being drawn by the same Sharpie uh, and for the same reason. And it's no longer about lineage. It's not about heritage or ethnicity. Um, it's not about anything else. It's, 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 about, um, it's about God doing something new in Jesus Christ. Yeah. And so that really starts to, um, I think, disrupt what everyone understood to be the status quo about how one was in relationship with God. Even those who were non, uh, not of the Jewish tradition understood themselves to be second-class citizens in the eyes of God. Mm. And so Paul is really doing something here that, um, frankly, uh, is not only disruptive, but it's also um, it's it's also quite radical. It's signaling, yeah, it's signaling mm -hmm. to the world mm -hmm. a radical shift of how God wishes to be known mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. and among. I like that. To me, it's uh, it's reminiscent of the conversation we had a few weeks ago with Pastor Colby, where we talked about the Romans text and sort of, mm -hmm. you think this way about these people and they think this way about you. And I need you to put all of this hostility beside, like get all yeah. of it, you know, put to death this hostility, because this is not how this body of Christ works. Well, that's right. I mean, you know, it's uh, it's another remember. Paul is telling us about something he's already written about. Remember, all comparisons are now out of order. Hostility and judging of others, it's out. There's no longer an us versus them mm. because there is no them in Christ yeah. but us. So I uh, when I was pastor of my oh, last when I was pastor at my last congregation, um and just getting started. I remember people coming to me in the council president at the time and saying, you know, they ought to do this and they ought to do that. Uh, you know, um, mm -hmm. speaking of how the church should be, you know, fixed and put back and 1967 should be ushered back into its uh, uh, glory and, and well-deserved mm -hmm. heyday. And at the top of every agenda, the church council president for the 10 years that I was pastor there, it passed from president to pa president the top of every council agenda, it said, we are they. Mm. Just a reminder to the council as leaders among leaders that there was no longer going to be this dichotomy of they or those people or that group. We are they. Mm. We are the church together. And I think idealistically, particularly Pastor AJ and our Lutheran church and expression of Lutheran church, I think that's baked into our DNA you know, that you and I are church together, um, our congregations, our church, our campus ministries, our church, our outdoor ministries, our um, our synods, our church-wide organization. We're all church together, but sometimes it's so easy to fall into the trap that Paul is warning us against, mm -hmm. pointing at, you know, who those people are, they are. Uh, even when we're pointing to something that is ourselves. Yeah. I got, um, so the only comment that I got, the episode that I shared where I had um, our historians here at St. Matthew's talk about um, our formerly enslaved uh, individual, Alexander, I had one person um, that reached out and was like, hey, I, can you change this? Like, I don't want people in my congregation to think that we're associated with them. And I was like, but you are right. Like we, this, this is a, you'll say Lutheran church. Like we are associated with them. And that's why it's important for us to name and to own these past. Like this is a part of what we've done and where we're at that it wasn't, you know, this isn't, well, that's that church. It's not this church, you know, it's, these are the sins of all of our past and for us to examine. Well, yeah. Right. And, for sure. And I think we're good at rejoicing with each other, 
Also sometimes true. we're not good at weeping and lamenting with each other. Mm. You know, it's you know we live in a time of tremendous uh, gun violence and tragedy that overwhelmed to the point where we become numb to it. Mm. But you know, this past month in our synod office chapel service, we observed uh, the martyrdom of the Emmanuel Nine. Mm. And, you know, of course, that reminds us that in 2015, a young man went into Mother Emanuel Church and uh, opened fire on people who were showing him hospitality at Bible study and prayer. Mm -hmm. And that's very, um, that's yeah. very, so I, I can see Mother Emanuel from my office, right? Like that's, that's yeah. literally and, a, I, across a park for us and um, how deep those wounds are. And for me, that commemoration never passes without me being reminded that the young man who perpetrated that crime dylan roof was a confirmed member of one of our congregations mm. that uh i don't think that we are personally responsible for the reprehensible um and ghastly uh thoughts that he um has about people of color but we are a church that um, either by avoiding hard conversation or not um, acknowledging the reality of sin, death, and the devil, um, we're not uh, party to seeing how that was festering in someone who is and was one of our own. Mm -hmm. So, it's you know, we are that church too. Yeah. And so when Paul offers this tremendous gift of grace, grace is not useful um, if we don't realize that we live in that death that Paul talks about too, mm -hmm. living, you know, condemned by the law that separates us from the other. And so, you know, if you look at the language, you know, it's uh, of Paul, insider, outsider, Jew, Gentile, you know, what Paul is saying, remember, that language has no meaning anymore if we live in Christ and Christ lives in us. Mm -hmm. And I love it because Paul is putting up, you know, his hand and a stop sign. Stop talking like that. Bishop Kevin Strickland um, from the Southeastern Synod is a good friend. And he reminds me regularly when I get a little bit frustrated with myself and uh, some of the more persnickety uh, parts of this church. He says, well, you know, uh, people behave the way that they're allowed to behave. Mm. and mm. that's right and paul is saying no no we're not going to behave like this anymore there's not going to be us there's not going to be them mm -hmm. you know and i think as you said it there's this this is such a poignant and uh timely message when even in the life of the church we're starting to divide out red and blue mm -hmm. this is that is not how it's supposed to be among us and that isn't to say that we should avoid any conversation about politics, because, of course, the gospel and the message of Jesus Christ is inherently political. But when we start identifying ourselves as partisans, mm. that's what Paul is coming against. Mm -hmm. Paul wants us to fight like hell uh, for that which we know to be right and true. But Paul wants our identity not to be, you know, red, blue, purple, uh, Paul wants our, our identity to be, to be, we do this not because we're Republicans or Democrats. We do it because we are of Christ and in Christ, and we are together in Christ. I share Golly, this. I wish that yeah. congregation could hear that. Yeah. yeah. I, I shared this actually in a sermon uh, I gave recently in, um, in here at St. Matthew's. Um, I think it might have been a funeral sermon, so maybe not everybody heard it. Anyways, it uh, I, I I talked about um, one of my professors at seminary, like who title 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 doesn't in her email it just said her name, child of God. That that's the most important title um, that she has that we all have, right? And to remember that always, you're talking to a child of God. You are a child of God. Well, and you know, I think the scripture really presses that hard. I mean, when we look at each other even the person that we are most repulsed by, they bear something of the image of God in them, in themselves and in their person. And you think about, you know, I, I, I was thinking about the other day uh, when I was a fairly new bishop, 
I got a phone call asking me to come to Charlottesville, Virginia hmm. for a prayer service and an, a rally toward interfaith solidarity. Okay. Um, and the person who called me said, we really could use some body count here. Um, you know, we're standing up to um, a group of people who are coming to protest the removal of some monuments and they are, they are rallying the troops. We really need to get there. I said, eh, well, Charlottesville, that's not long drive drive from Baltimore, you know, I'll do it. And they said, you know, we really, you know, bishops in particular, it'd be nice to have some folk, you know, who, who have authority to, to be with us. So I went and, um, and I really did think I was doing a favor for my friend. You know, I'd have my picture taken. I'd get a chance to have lunch with my friend, you know, we'd sing, we shall overcome. And I'd head on home. Holy crap. Mm -hmm. You know, I get there and the gates of hell were wide open mm. and you know we were gathered for worship in the episcopal church and you know the the younger section of the proud boys were you know circling the church with their with their tiki torches being ridiculous but also being um incredibly uh, fear inducing mm -hmm. and um, you know, to see the terror reflected in other people's faces was, yeah. particularly young people's faces, was really overwhelming. To have police officers offering to escort me to my car because they feared for my safety mm. was a new feeling for this, you know, displaced pastor turned bishop. Well, I didn't think, you know, I, I sort of, my heart was racing. I was getting through it. My friend and I were debriefing. But then I, I did what, you know, you do on things like this. I checked into the local Hampton Inn. You know, I like their sheets and I like their, their breakfast in the morning. And the next day we were going to counter protest those who were going to take Centennial Park. Hi. So I get up the next morning as I do when I'm at the Hampton Inn to get, you know, a malted waffle. Breakfast. And yeah. And so the guy right in front of me is standing there in a neo-Nazi t-shirt. Like right in front of me in the breakfast line. And he's, he's with others who've got, you know, swastikas tattooed on their arms and you know they've got their protest paraphernalia nearby and it's like and no one i felt like no one was looking at this like this is strange but this is pretty screwed up and there are children you know they came with their families there are children there and uh you know i i just remember fe feeling so nauseated in that moment, and I got my hiney over to where I was supposed to be. But when I read this text to prepare for our conversation today, I thought to myself, how, how can I see these folk in light of what Paul is talking about? Mm -hmm. You know, when the group marched into Centennial Park, um, they were led by a processional cross. Like someone in that group had enough of a relationship with their church and apparently had a key that they could walk in and take the take the cross that we carry up the aisle uh, right into the park. How do we have, you know, it, you know, it used to be other was, you know, a matter of ethnic background. It was a matter of socioeconomic background. It was uh, uh, about sexual orientation or gender identity, maybe. But now... I mean, the other is in plain sight, mm. and it's and it's of the heart, and it's of the mind, and I think Paul is really very challenging here because as we come into a bruising election cycle, even with gritted teeth, we have to, according to Paul, recognize in our own death the same thing that we recognize as in the death of others, and we have to find something of the divine to see the other whomever the other is with the eyes of christ mm. and let me tell you something it doesn't sound like much fun it's, it's good when it's applied to me but it's hard when i have to apply it to someone else <laughs> yeah it's certainly one of the harder things that we have to do um which actually like that to me like the the thing i read you know it's sort of remember this okay I think for us, it's like, it's one thing to say it, but then like, how do we live this out? Like, how do we actually follow this? How do, what does it mean for mm -hmm. us to, to do this in the world? 
Well, and the thing is, how many times have we said it can't happen? Hmm. When we think about, you know, the presidential election cycle, you know, is there some way to bridge something of the gap, something of the divide? I mean, I, I shrug my shoulder. Look, it can't happen. You know, the, the ability to share governance, which was a hallmark of um, a two-party system when I was growing up, uh, seems to be a, a thing of the past. Mm. So when you think about um, what Paul is talking about, humanly, can we even conceive of the idea, can we imagine or hope for the kind of reconciliation among hostile groups that Paul's talking about? Mm -hmm. I don't know about you, as someone who's worked for peace and reconciliation, it's exhausting. And frankly, after a while, you're like, well, you know, to heck with it. And we're not getting anywhere. It just can't happen. You know, how it's 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 like Jesus on the cross, you know, uh, you know, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Um, how many times do we just look around and say, well, you know, this is a God forsaken place or this is a God forsaken people or, you know, God, why have you forsaken me? When we know better. As Christians, we know better. God never forsakes us. Yeah. We're never alone. But Paul's point is, in Christ, this reconciliation did happen, and that it can happen. That it's a both and. It is a reality, and it's an aspiration. And that the gospel is that radical, that explosive, it's revolutionary, it, it anything less than that is to try to domesticate Ooh, the gospel of Jesus word. Christ. That's a good word. Yeah. And it's not about you know, it's not about being nice. It's not about it's not about, you know, chin up and smiling. It's not even about agreeing to disagree. It's about it's about turning back to the gospel and letting God be God and listening intently, thoughtfully, carefully, and deliberately for God to speak. Mm -hmm. And I'm not talking about God to speak. This is the person you should elect as president of the United States. Yeah. But to listen for how God would speak, this is how you are to love one another. Yeah. This is how you're to be reconciled in Jesus mm -hmm. Christ. Um, I have a, a quote from uh, Bishop Andy Doyle, another an Episcopal bishop. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, from Texas. Yeah. Oh. He says, you see... The church often gets evangelism wrong. We think it's about what others have to do in order to be saved instead of what we must do so that others may be saved. What must we do to embody what we must do is embody the humility of Christ and reveal our brokenness and need for grace and forgiveness. I like that as he relates that to this text in this way of what do we have to do to be open to bridging that divide? And that it's not an us and them and that it is a, a we. And um, what what do we have to do? Well, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to say that Bishop Doyle is um, presuming, mm. hoping. Yeah. Um, staking a claim that we would dare in such a divisive age to dream such a dream. Oh. That, that this, that, I mean, we have to, we have to, we have to start being, being by being open to this isn't even, that this is even a possibility. And we have to stop seeing our evangelical urgency to get more butts in the seats and money in the plates. Yeah. Because Paul's evangelical urgency, and it's really quite clear here, is to see hearts that are transformed in time and for mm. eternity. Paul's aspiration here is that we would come to hope as radically as he speaks to us of Jesus Christ. And, and, as believers to live in that radical way. You know, Bishop Doyle is spot on. I mean, it really does have to be something about what comes out of here has to come out of our hearts. What it comes out of our mouths has to come from our hearts. We have, to, we have to walk a particular walk of a talk that we talk. And that is easier said than done. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. You know, for, for your listeners, uh, so many of us will be in church on July 21st and we'll hear uh, this reading. And most of us won't hear any of it. You know, it'll be like the Charlie Brown adult. Wah, 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 wah. And sometimes we're like that with Paul. And because the epistle doesn't often form the preaching event, mm-hmm. we might miss something here. And what I fear that we'll miss is that these, and, and, I, and I've heard it these last weeks too, Paul is speaking to us for such a time as this. Mm-hmm. And Paul is, you know, a couple of weeks ago I was in church and I was prepared to preach on um, the, the Hebrew scripture reading. And as I was, you know, sitting in my seat listening to the lector proclaim the word, I'm, you know, getting my notes and together, my manuscript ready to unfold. And of course, I had to read the gospel as the preacher of the day. And it was, uh, it was, it was, it was Romans, you know, uh, my grace is sufficient for you. Uh, my power made perfect in weakness. And it was like, you know, it was like that, you know, duh moment. Like, this is what, this is what I need to hear about right now. And my sense is most preachers preach a sermon that they need to hear. Mm-hmm. So I think Bishop Doyle, you, me, our listeners, those who are preparing for the preaching event, we all need to think about what is actually happening in the life of the world around us. And what is the sermon we need to hear? And to be honest with you, God, I think, blesses that as with evangelical urgency. Because if we need to hear something, if we need to be reminded of our siblinghood, if we need to uh, be reminded in a deeply divided age of being united in this spiritual house that Paul, uh, you know, casts as uh, a possibility, then others need to hear that too. And churches are so often fearful and they're led by um, fearful folk like you and me, you say, well, if I tell that truth, if I, if I preach that gospel, people will leave. But I think what we fail to consider is what Paul points to today. People will leave. And the door will be wide open for others to come. Mm. Also yeah. for people to return. Paul is doing something really crazy here, and I and I think Bishop Doyle is right. There is there is a, a right understanding of evangelism in it. Mm-hmm. There's there's a truth that needs to be told, and frankly, a truth that people are longing to hear. Yeah, I always say it like this: is sort of like my job. My job isn't to save anyone. Um, that's Jesus's job. He took care of that. My job is to love and to serve and to swing that door wide open so that people can see that love through what I do, through the community that we're creating and making space. And to me, that's what he's really getting at too Mm -hmm. with this, right? Of saying like, there's all these things that we could focus on. There's all these things that like could divide us. But if we stop with this mentality of I'm right and you're wrong, my theology is better than yours, or I read the Bible this way and that's the more superior way and you are... You know, if we just stop all of that and focus on what Jesus asks us to do, um, I've said this on the podcast before, right? There's the mm-hmm. the to-do list and the what not to-do list, right? And I think that's what Paul is focusing on us to. Stop focusing on the what not to-do list. Focus on the to-do list. Put to death this hostility that we are all one in Christ. And this is our job in this covenant is to love and to serve. That's our to-do list. It's much shorter. Yeah, Um Dr. Bonnie Vandalinder, who was once a professor at Gettysburg Seminary and now of blessed memory, uh, once challenged a homiletics class to think about how we are preaching um, not a bombastic relationship, but an emerging friendship Mm. with God and with one another. Mm. And that isn't to diminish the authority, power, or sovereignty of God by saying, well, God is, you know, our, you know, Take and punch, you know, stop by uh, in the afternoon, you know, buddy or friend. But that God is inviting us into a relationship, a, a friendship that's actually far more significant and deep 
than uh, most of us have with anyone else. Mm. There's, there's an intimacy, there's a knowledge, but there's also an openness to, re- to give and to receive, not just to deliver. Yeah. And in the world that we live in, unfortunately, we've, we've made so much of our relationships transactional. And that's not what the, Paul is talking about. That's not what God is about. There's no transaction to be had here. God is God, and because God is God, this is how we are invited to be free to live, to mm-hmm. believe, to, to dream, and to behave. Um, uh, you know, thinking about what you're just saying, uh, when I was ordained, um, the bishop then of the Metropolitan New York Senate was Stephen Paul Bowman. And I'll never forget, as he presented me to the congregation, he charged me to be an icon, an image through which people wouldn't see me, but would know God. Hmm. And likened it to, you know, iconography, you know, an image that causes people to be drawn deeper to the heart of God, to the to the knowledge of God. Hmm. And, and I think there's something to that where... Again, it's not like pasting a smile on our face and pretending to be in relationship or to be nice to other people whose ideologies and behaviors we can't stand. But it's about recognizing it's not our words that do the conversion, that do the circumcision of the heart, Mm -hmm. but it's the power of the Holy Spirit made known in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. That sometimes that means speaking, sometimes it means shutting one's trap, sometimes it means acting, and sometimes it means calling out, and sometimes it means just letting the gates of hell rage for a moment, knowing that we have a sure promise that uh, the gates of hell will not prevail against Christ's church. Yeah. I don't know. It's um, it's 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 a it's a it's a fascinating thing that Paul is scratching at here. Agreed. And um, someone said to me yesterday, "Lather, rinse, rage, repeat as necessary." <laughs> yeah, but that's. I think I think that's right. Uh, yeah. That sometimes the, the I, seasons is hard. And that it just it felt like a very Lutheran phrase, right? As we talk about our death and resurrection yeah. and where we're at in our relationship with each other and God. Lather, rinse, rage, and repeat. Isn't that what Luther would say uh, uh, in when he says that we return to our baptism each day? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's yeah, and and the thing is, the only caveat I would attach to that is the rage piece. You can't rage at the same volume at everything. Sometimes, yeah. as Christians, we have to collect our voices. Yeah. Um, William Barber uh, from the Poor People's Campaign mm-hmm. has been an important example and mentor for me, reminding me that we don't have to, you know, spit into every wind, but we need to gather co-conspirators and partners to march into every storm. Mm-hmm. And um, I th- I think that you know no matter um, how this election cycle turns out, I think that these next years are going to be really challenging for the church because we need to continue to speak truth and love. Yeah, and we need to keep putting our bodies in the way of those who can't imagine what Paul is talking about. Um, Mm. What it would be like to welcome as full siblings those who um, we would name deplorable. Um, It's and it's not going to be easy. And I think that's the, the biggest lie that we sometimes buy into in the life of the church is that, you know, Jesus says, love our neighbor as ourselves. And we're like, oh, yeah, that's fine. I'll do that. That's great. This is hard work. Very hard. 
And, you know, I think Paul makes that point in this passage too. You know, that Christ is our peace. Well, the work of peacemaking, if anyone is paying attention to what's happening in the life of this nation, um, our cities, our communities, our schools, and our world, the work of peacemaking is just that. It's hard work. Mm -hmm. And it requires sacrifice of something of the self. And it reminds me that we have to do twice as much listening as we do talking. It's, it's, there is, there is a task before us. There is a mission for being the church in this age. And Paul is, I think, tr really trying to bear down, circumcise those places of our hearts that have become hard or brittle, circumcising those corners of our minds that have become immovable, trying to circumcise our faith so that it might be um, more clearly uh, witness to the covenant that God made with us uh, in Jesus Christ. That was really beautiful, and I love it how many ways that you um, use the verb circumcise in that in that very beautiful sentence. Well, I'm really brave here on your podcast. I don't know <laughs> that I'll be throwing the word circumcise around in the pulpit quite as often, because every time you throw the word circumcise around in the pulpit, uh, a number of men blanch. Um, you get everyone's uh, uh, attention, though. It's true. That is true. Um I um I recently yeah. uh helped with the uh queer confirmation materials that are coming out and I use it wasn't this one I think it was from Galatians it was the same thing talking about the circumcised and the uncircumcised and and I changed um the language intentionally to to say the insider and the outsider um mm -hmm. because in that like that's what the the text is getting at right and the instant you say circumcised in front of some teenagers they don't hear anything else you're going to say um so to change that language of like what what Paul is you know getting at is there's this insider and outsider language but that no you're now all one in Christ Jesus yeah, yeah. i think that um something i've said before i think even on this podcast is we must not mistake unity for uniformity. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I think that, um, you know, you, you just said that it was, about the, you know, the confirmation materials. And I, I think of how many times I've seen the word confirmation misspelled conformation, mm -hmm. you know, that we're trying to conform. train yep. people to conform to our, you know, theological tradition. Whereas actually we're trying to confirm people in, uh, in the faith uh, that we share uh, conforming to tradition versus confirming in faith or affirming mm -hmm. the covenant God did with us in baptism is a far different thing. Mm -hmm. Jesus has a word for that. Discipling. Mm -hmm. uh, discipling is about passing the faith, uh, you know, from one to another, from one generation to the next. It's not about, um, enforcing a tradition um or a set of values that can can never be um revisited mm -hmm. well i mean that's the same and thing I, with the circumcision right like that's what it is you don't have to be circumcised to be a part of this you don't have to conform to this thing and i think that's you know that's uh, that's where i was headed uh, in the windmills of my mind there for a second mm -hmm. but yeah paul is saying you have access, you have place, you have a part. Mm -hmm. And it has nothing to do whether or not you, you know, passed your confirmation exam or, you know, for some of us of a particular age, we're publicly examined or, you know, mm -hmm. we, we all have access. And our access is, you know, the trump card. It's Jesus Christ. Yeah. But the urgency is in Paul's right in, in Paul's writing today, the urgency is for those of us who claim to be in Christ. We have to test that claim about how, in how we see others. Yeah, mm. and the church is notorious for being complicit in this insider outsider language, mm -hmm. more than language behavior. Yeah, you know, think, think about how you know. Oh, you want to be buried in our cemetery? Well, were they a member? Oh, you want to rent the hall? Are they members? You know, 
oh, they want to have a performance in our sanctuary. Well, what members are going to, you know, it's not a club. Now, admittedly, we have a number of clubhouses, but it's not a club. And Paul talks about that really clearly. What Christ is building us up into is not church buildings, but the spiritual body of being church together. Hmm. Church buildings are wonderful tools, but they should never be mistaken for actually the building that Paul is talking about, which is yeah. us. Hmm. Amen to that. Thank you, Bishop, for joining us um, on this final episode of our season. Mm -hmm. I can't I... wait for next season and yeah, the surprises too. that are still in front of us. Oh, yeah. Me too, because there's some good ones coming up. I'm very excited. Um, everyone, I hope that you have a great rest of your summer. Um, we'll catch up in the fall with season four. Um, there are some fun new things coming down the pipeline for season four. So stay tuned for an announcement on what those are closer to the beginning of our season. Um, as always, remember uh, that you can learn more about the podcast uh, and find us on Facebook and Instagram at 10 Football Podcast. And of course, our website, 10 Podcast.com, where you can find all past episodes and um, more stuff there. Uh, and as well as um, you can listen to the podcast and all of its episodes wherever you listen to podcasts. And remember that this podcast is a ministry of the Delaware, Maryland Synod. To learn more, go to DEMCSynod.org. Woo woo! Take care.